road she traveled, and her women who made a difference. A Kula Kids gift to our community. Welcome to a personal interview with Dolly Osborne and conducted on April 28, 2006 by Luke E. Part 2. So was that a good pay, $55 a week? Uh, $55 a week, $50, $55 a week was very good pay then. Uh, it wasn't, of course, anything like the men made, but, but uh, people who worked in factories and stuff didn't make that much, if not much more than that. So, being 15 years old, you know, I couldn't get a job for that. Um, I, even in the 60s, when I came back and was playing ball for uh, NAPA and people like that, I would get jobs in the summer because I would play for their softball teams. They would hire me to work in their factories. I didn't make but a dollar and a half an hour. So, that was pretty good pay uh, in the 50s. And especially for 15 years old, you know, I, I had quite a bit of money. And I had, the first year, my dad said I could save part of it to buy a horse, and I just about got killed on that thing. <laughs> I went off in the road, uh, in a road, and got beat up pretty bad. But um, So the next year, when I was 17, then after I had played for a few years, I, I, uh, my mom and dad didn't have a car. They didn't own a car, neither one of them drove, so I bought a car uh, because my dad said, well, you can buy it and I'll help you with the insurance if you take us where we want to go, which wasn't a problem because I drive anywhere. You know, I love to drive. Most 17-year-olds do, yeah. you know, so I would take him everywhere. Uh, so actually, fifty-five dollars, fifty, fifty-five dollars was not was not bad pay for a job then. Uh, it wasn't like anything that professionals people make now. And they, frankly, I think they make too much between you and I. Well, they I do. They make way too much. It has become a business, and and I think it's taken a lot of the fun out of the game. Did anyone else in your family play baseball? My dad played baseball. My dad was a pitcher, and um, he played, when he played in the early 1900s, uh, every single uh, church had a team, and he played for Presbyterian Church. He played for his church, and he was a pitcher. He did have an opportunity to play professionally, but could not do so because his mom was sick and he had family to take care of and guys then didn't make a lot of money playing professionally. If you looked at what Babe Ruth made compared to what they make now, it wasn't a lot of money. And they might have made hundreds of thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars. That was a lot of money then, but compared to today it wasn't a lot of money. My brother also played. Uh, he's older than I. He played um, first base and he was a pitcher. So what, did he play any triple-A, double-A? Well, he had an opportunity to go, I think it was a Class D team was going to pick him up, but uh, he decided not to. He uh, he got a job out of high school and got married and had four kids and had a lot of responsibilities, so he decided that he did have an opportunity to go, but he did not. Did pitching come easy to you? Um, yeah, I didn't, you know, I, I always threw and uh, I played, when I played for the boys team, I played uh, third base sometimes, shortstop sometimes, uh, second base, first base. Uh, I played infield when I played for the boys team, uh, but I always liked to pitch too as well. And I did pitch some, but not a great deal. But I think because of my dad's interest in pitching, we used to throw a lot together, so I would try different pitches. Um, I, uh, my, my best pitch was a really, really sharp curveball. It curved really big. Um, and uh, I don't, people ask me, how fast is your fastball? And I have no clue because we didn't really measure then, you know, now. Yeah, Even radar. little leaguers, they measure to see how fast they throw it. We didn't really measure. Um, so I had uh, a variety of pitches, and it, we played with a 10-inch ball, 
and sometimes you know that's a that's a little bit bigger so it's uh, I have long fingers but to throw you could throw a lot of different pitches with that but the one I was working on was a uh, was a knuckleball and uh, I was glad when we went to the nine inch ball because that's a little bit easier to control. Knuckleballs are real hard to control. So I was working on a knuckleball for the next year or so. I was hoping maybe we could, we'd have another year. I was really wanted to learn to throw that and um, see if I could perfect a knuckleball. Those are hard as heck to hit. Hard as heck to throw too. <laughs> did you ever, well, how did you feel about how the men were being paid more than you? How did you feel about that? Well, I don't know. I I guess being young like that, 14, 15 years old, I was just having fun and, and making money, and I didn't really jump in on social issues that much. I was, you know, 15, you, you, just, you just enjoy what you're doing, and I was doing what I wanted to do, and, and if I got paid for it, that was great, you know? <laughs> I guess I didn't compare salaries of what the men were making. And it's a little different, I guess, until I got through college, I I guess maybe I uh, then felt that men making more money for doing the same things wasn't exactly fair. But I knew that also it had, especially in baseball, it has to do with the number of fans that come to the game that's tied up in, in that. And when we were on tour, uh, we made, we got a percentage of the gate. And then we divided according to the percentage of the gate. So if you had a huge amount of fans, you got pretty good money. If you didn't, you didn't. Uh, and if you got rained out for two weeks, you were really in trouble. You didn't have any money. I think one time I was in Kenosha. We were, our team was in Kenosha, and I think I had 25 cents in my pocket. That was it. <laughs> and I lived in North Carolina, so I wasn't sure how I was going to get back home. Uh, so, but then the next day, the sun came out, we played another game, we got a few bucks. And, and uh, one of the team members uh, that we played against, one of the guys, owned a restaurant and he invited us over for dinner so we got a free dinner and and so then things started turning around so you had to pay for your own room and board uh on tour we did yes um when we played in the league we did get some meal money uh, on the road when we weren't on the road we had to live in we had to live in homes we could not live in apartments uh, we had to live in a home uh, like, a, well, I think the loggers even yeah, do that. Yeah, they do that. Yeah, but we had to. We had no choice. Uh, we lived in a home with a family, and um, a lot of times the families would have uh, gardens out there, and I mostly ate out of their garden. <laughs> I, I uh, ate tomato sandwiches and tomato and cucumber sandwiches most of the summer at home. But you have to remember, we were on the road like three, four days at a time, so and we were home three, four days at a time, so we were on the road a lot. And we did get meal money, and they did pay for our hotel rooms and stuff. So we did get some expense money. I don't remember exactly how much we got those last few years, uh, how much expense money we got. So that did help as far as salary is concerned. You'd have to count that as income as well. So you got along with everyone on your team, right? I'm sorry? You got along with everybody on your baseball team? Oh, yeah. Team? Yeah, we, we did. We got along really well. Uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, fights and disagreements and stuff like that. Uh, you know, we were a team. And I was the youngest one, so my dad gave me a bit of advice when I left home. And it proved to be really good advice. Because, you know, when you're 14, 15 years old, you have a tendency to you know, try to make your own way, you're independent, you want to be treated differently, you want to be independent and all that, and uh, sometimes you get in trouble uh, when you use your mouth too much, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, my dad told me, he said, you know, you're going to be a rookie, and he said, rookies get a lot, take lots of stuff, they get after you a lot, or on your back a lot, because you are a rookie. 
and he said, if you start mouthing off and you get smart mouth, they'll really get on your case then. He said, I tell you what, you keep your mouth shut and you be pleasant and you say, if they tell you something, even if you know it, you say, okay, thank you <laughs> and let it go. He said, because if you act smart and you act like you know everything, he said, you will have a tough time. And he was right, because I saw some rookies who came in and did that. And I took his advice because uh, you, they do give rookies hard times. They play tricks on them and stuff like that. And I enjoy that. I like to play tricks on other people. <laughs> I do it all the time. Um, I do it to my kids um, all the time. <laughs> They're used to it now. Well, they're not really used to it. They used to get embarrassed, but they don't anymore. But uh, they do. They they play tricks on you and get after you, and you know. So you got to expect that. And uh, if you're a rookie who goes in and you think you know everything, uh, you're put in your place real quick. And uh, I uh, was glad that my dad said that to me because. Um, I learned really fast by watching other rookies who stuck their foot in their mouth constantly. And uh, I prefer to trim my toenails with a toenail trimmer instead of in my mouth. <laughs> you know? So it was, uh, I, I got to watch that. No, the, I still see a lot of those women now. As a matter of fact, um, I'm going to the Hall of Fame on Mother's Day. In Cooperstown? In Cooperstown, yeah. And uh, one of the women I'm going with uh, was my roommate in South Bend. And we're going to meet one of my roommates that was my roommate in Fort Wayne uh, at Cooperstown. And we're all going to stay together and have a... Uh, they're unveiling a statue of a woman baseball player at Cooperstown uh, opening a new display for the women. So... Uh, It'll be a lot of fun. I don't see my other roommate very often. She lives in California now. So, uh, and she and I were always in trouble because we were the trick, we were the goofy trick players on the team. So, Katie Hortzman is her name. I call her Horsey. And uh, we were always, if anything was going on, uh, usually Horsey and I were involved in it. <laughs> you know, we got to play all the tricks. How did you get the name Dolly Lippy Vanderlip? Well, my last name was Vanderlip, so they started calling me Lippy. Because I did, uh, I did, I did say Wiseacre stuff to everybody all the time. I still do. You know, <laughs> I still give people, you know, in a fun way, give people trouble. Um, so, um, that, they, my name was Vanderlip, so they called me Lippy. Everybody had a nickname back then. Not many people have nicknames anymore. Some people get upset by them. I think we get a little too touchy now. Um, I've been called much worse than Lippy, though, believe me. <laughs> so I don't worry about it. What was the favorite trick you played? Oh, well, I don't know. We did so many. Uh, I guess maybe putting itch itching powder in, in bras. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, that, was um, uh, that kind of thing. Um, let's see. We used to drop water balloons out of the hotels. Uh, you know. <laughs> did you get like in trouble for that? Today? Yep, we did get in trouble for that. Uh, but we had to be careful what we did because we um, we were. Uh, we had to um, be charged money. If we got too much trouble, they would they would fine us. So we didn't do anything really bad, otherwise we got fined. Now, we had a lot of rules, too. Uh, your hair had to be down uh, on your collar. It couldn't be short. I couldn't wear this hairdo that I have now, the short hairdo, even though my hair is naturally curly and all that. I couldn't wear the short hairdo. I had to, we had to wear hair down to our collars. Uh, we had to wear dresses or skirts everywhere we went. Uh, we could not wear slacks or blue jeans or shorts. We could on the bus. Uh, so we, a tailor in Fort Wayne made us uh, wrap around skirts. 
and they're skirts that just wrap around and they have a little hole in the front and you stick a part of the skirt through there and you wrap it around and then tie it in front like an apron. And it's really like an apron, but it's a fully it's a full skirt. And so he made us some wraparound skirts and when we got off the bus, we put those over our shorts. Uh, so we could not go in the hotel, we could not go in public at all without dresses. When we went to the ballpark at night, we had to wear a dress or a skirt to the ballpark. Um, just going from our car to dress, we had to have a skirt. Of course, we played in skirts too. That wasn't good for sliding, I tell you. Oh, yeah. Oh. Grip off your legs. Oh. One of the ladies on our team, uh, her name was Betty Foss, she was she was an excellent ball player and a big lady. And both of her hips were ripped up all summer because, you know, some people are easy sliders. They can slide right across the top. Oops. And some are hard sliders. They boom, they hit the ground hard. Betty was a hard slider, but she slid a lot. And she would have strawberries on both hips all summer. She would no sooner get that thing all, not even cleared up, but just have a nice scab over it. She'd slide again and just rip it right off again. Ooh, that was nasty. But they gave us sliding pads, but they didn't do any good because sliding pads, they hook down right above the knee and they hook up at the hip. And when you slide, the pad comes up anyway. So, you know, it didn't, didn't help any. You know, there was nothing holding it down. The only way is if you could have, you know, glued it on or something, and that wouldn't even have worked. <laughs> that would have hurt. Yeah, well. yeah. We didn't have super glue anyway, but, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, sliding was was the thing that was difficult, in uh, with those uh, types of uniforms. But we also had uh, we had a curfew. And if you broke any of these rules, you were fined. And we didn't make a lot of money, so if you were fined $10, that's, that's quite a bit of money out of 55, you know, a week. 50, 55 a week, that's a lot of money. You know, if you're fined 10 bucks or five bucks or something, um, that'd be like guys getting fined a million now. You know, they make 10 million, they get fined a million. They don't find them that much, but that'd be the same thing. Um, but uh, we had curfews. We had to be in at a certain hour. Uh, when Bill Allington had our team, we had um, meetings in the morning on the road, and we had quizzes. He'd hand them out the night before, and you had to study the rule book and know the rules, and you also had to uh, know plays, and he would ask you if there was a runner on first and second, and you're playing right field, didn't matter whether that was your position or not. You're playing right field and you get a fly ball. Where do you play the ball? There's two outs. There's one out. There's no outs. You know, he would he would throw things at you and you're sitting there and you better know what you do with the ball and when and how and where and all of that. And um, if you didn't, then you had to run wind sprints. And pitchers ran wind sprints anyway. He would just add to your wind sprints. Everybody ran wind sprints, but pitchers ran more because your pitching arm is directly related to how good your legs are. If your legs are in really top-notch condition, you have better control. Your pitching arm is your legs. That's your legs. And uh, one great player, Dizzy Dean, got hit on the foot, went back to pitching too soon, and threw his arm away. So every night we were wind sprints, and a wind sprint is on the first baseline to the wall, fast as you can go. Walk back, first baseline, to the wall. Walk back, to the wall. And then we used to play a game uh, where there was a fungo hitter on, a, on a, let's say you're on the first baseline, our left field, right field line, and they're on the left field line. They would hit the ball up high, and you would run as fast as you could to try to catch it. And if you got it in your glove and you dropped it, they added 10 wind sprints. So you had to catch it. And you're not an outfielder, you're a pitcher, but you still had to, had to catch it. And if you didn't catch it, you got 10 more wind sprints, just like that. Uh, if you had it in your glove. It was, it was way out of your reach and they didn't. But uh, if you could play it, 10 wind sprints. 
And if the person at the phone goes, it was really nasty, sometimes they just give you 10 wet sprints anyway. <laughs> okay, you should have had that. Unhook that train when you're running and you wouldn't be so slow. <laughs> so, you know, unhook the train. So, um, they would add wind sprints and if you, if you weren't, um, if you didn't, weren't able to answer the questions in the meetings, uh, you got wins, extra wind sprints too as well. So, so it's generic punishment. Uh -huh. <laughs> Did that's that help right. you like learn the plays and stuff? Because you didn't want to do a wind sprint? Oh, yeah. yeah. We studied the night before. We'd, we'd have a study group and we'd study everything. He would ask questions and then we would fire questions at each other. And his favorite thing, one of his things to do was if you, if someone goofed on a play the night before, you better be watching a game. Because if someone goofed on a play the night before, he would remember that and that's what he would ask the next day. So you better be watching, and he would ask you. He might even come to the bench and ask you. If I'm, I'm a pitcher and I'm sitting on the bench, we didn't sit way out in the bullpen. Our bullpen was right outside. We sat on the bench, and our job was to watch the game and to try to steal the uh, signals of the other team. That was our job as a pitcher. We tried to steal signals. So we had to be watching the game. And he might come off the field, and you're sitting there, and he'll say, where should she have played that ball? Okay, Vanderlip, where, what would you have done with that ball? And you better be able to answer him. So you, I mean, he he would ask you just like that. And there was no, I saw one girl sent home. She fell asleep on the bench. She was sitting beside me. I didn't know she was even asleep because I wasn't paying attention to her. I was watching the game. And he came off the off the field from third base to first, we were the uh, visiting team. And uh, he came off the field and he told me to move over. He said, move over. I said, okay. I didn't know what was going on. I moved over. And he said, I want room for her to lay down because she needs a rest. She's gonna be on the bus in the morning. And in the morning, she had a bus ticket and was out of there. And she was a rookie. She had a bus ticket and she was gone. So I thought, hmm, don't go to sleep on the bench. <laughs> you know, you're out of here if you go to sleep on the bench. And he sent her home. Wow. I mean, she was gone the next morning. So, so see that. That's um, it, it. Didn't surprise me coming from him. I like I said, he was the best manager that I ever had. Bill Allington. He knew more about baseball than anybody I ever met. Ever met. And I met a lot of good coaches, but he knew more about baseball than anyone I've ever seen. And he used to make the rookies practice a lot. He was, uh, he would, uh, coming home from a road trip sometime, he'd get home three, four o'clock in the morning. And uh, if it was a long trip, like to Rockford or something. And he would call practice the next morning, especially if we didn't play well, he would call practice. And that's usually when the whole team practiced. But he would um, call outfielders, and then he was, since I was a rookie, and he was trying to, trying to get me to play better and aggravate me too, I think, he would say rookies, uh, he'd say outfielders and Vanderlip. Well, he'd do that every road game, so, he, and then he'd say infielders and Vanderlip. <laughs> and he'd say pitchers and catchers. That included me. So then he'd say, um, Okay, outfielders, and I, he got to the place where I, I would raise my hand and say, okay, and Vanderlip, before he said it, because I knew he was going to get me anyway, so I might as well just put my two cents worth in. So I got to go to every practice when I had Bill, and it was okay. It does, doesn't hurt you. It gets kind of tiring, though, because you're, you're tired like everybody else. You have to go to practice every day. <laughs> you know, everybody else didn't, but you did. So I could have felt picked on, and so I just sort of went, okay, <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> he's the boss. Huh? Have, that's the attitude you have to have. Yeah, he's the boss. Wouldn't have done me any good to get upset. Did you feel your schooling was important? Uh, yes. Well, when I went back to school when I was 16, I, I was kind of bored with school and everything, and my dad said, well, 
he said, okay. He said, uh, yeah, quit school, huh? I said, yeah. I thought that was smart. And um, he said, okay. So the next morning he got me up at 5 o'clock and said, um, you have to go find a job. Your mother is the only, has the only job in this house, and I'm not firing her. So <laughs> you have to. <laughs> and I said, we live way out in the country, and we didn't have any transportation, so I had to catch a bus. Uh, came by the house at six o'clock in the morning, and I said, "Well, bus doesn't." I said, "Geez, unemployment doesn't open until nine o'clock." He said, "Well, that's okay. You'll be first in line." And I thought, "Well, this is not very smart. I'm, I mean, I'm dumb, but I'm not stupid." So I thought, "Well, you know, I think I'll go back to school. This getting up at four thirty to catch a bus isn't for me." <laughs> so. And he said, you better be in school. I call your mom. You better be on the school bus when I call. Or you better have a job, one of the two. So I was back in school, and then I went on to college and went on to get a master's degree and decided school was a, a good deal, you know. So I, and then when I started to get my master's degree, my dad sort of chuckled and said, holy cow, I kept you in school. Now I can't get you out, <laughs> which is true. And I love school. I, it was just a matter of, I had been away, I had played ball, and school was kind of, everything changed after I had been out on my own. You know, I lived away from home. Um, I lived on my own and everything changed. And I went through a period there when I got back and thought, you know, I thought school was kind of, kind of boring. but. Then, um, and I think too, I changed too. I don't, I, I don't think I was probably a typical high school kid anymore because I had lived with adults. Everybody was older than me and I had lived with adults. And I think that, that changed my outlook on things. But my dad changed it back real quick, <laughs> really quick. <laughs> making me understand that school was very important. And I loved school. I loved to have stayed in all of my life. I mean, I would have been a perennial student if I could have afforded to do so. I would have stayed in school. There's a lot of things I'd like to take now. I love to learn now. I, I got over that period of where I thought learning was kind of, you know, kind of bad, but now I, I love to learn, you know, I love to learn everything. I like to go back now, as a matter of fact. I think three or four things I'd like to take. I'd like to go to vet school. I'd like to go to architecture school. I'd like to, you know, I'd like, there's a lot of things I would like to go back to. But it takes money, lots of money to do that. Well, I had something on But when you were playing, did they ever, you didn't have school, did you? No tutors or anything? No. No, I, they wouldn't. I was late getting back to school in the fall, and I had to catch up. I think that's another thing that sort of, sort of bothered me too, is I had to catch up. Uh, but I mean, I didn't have any trouble catching up. It was just a lot of work trying to catch up. But I, they didn't. The league, the league wouldn't let me leave until school was out. So I didn't get to go. School was out. If school was out on Wednesday. I was on my way on Thursday, so they didn't let me leave until school was out. Unfortunately, I missed spring training, and I, I think that was a a detriment to you know to my playing because I missed spring training. Were most players on your team about your age at the time? No, the next youngest player I think was Katie on Fort Wayne, Katie and Joe, Joe Weaver, and I think they were either 17 or 18, so they were two or three years older than me. What was the oldest person on your team? How old were they? Oh my gosh, I don't remember. In, in their 20s. So it was a fairly 26, young team. 26, 27, yeah. Well, it's different for women too, because most of the women, if they got married, most of them quit. You know, uh, some didn't, but usually if they got married, they quit. Uh, and I think that was typical of most things that women did at that time. If they worked and they got married, they quit to raise a family and that kind of thing. Uh, so, 
uh, I don't think many of them would have stayed past 30 years old. Most of them, if they got married, were married in their 20s. Plus, it was real difficult to get a job just for, we didn't make enough money to live the year round off that money. So it was difficult to get a job just for nine months. And your employers didn't want to let you go for uh, three months out of the year and take you back. So each time you had to go back and get another job. And that's why most of the girls who played were either in college or in school. And I went on to college, so it didn't bother me. I could leave after college and come back. Even if I was late, I could pre-register. I think that wraps it up. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about like conflicts that you faced or anything else? Well, the only conflict that I really had was in North Carolina, we had um, girls basketball in high school. And I had played in junior high. Before, uh, at the end of junior high, at the end of the ninth grade is when I left to play baseball. Um, and when I went back, I could not play high school basketball because I was a professional. I tried to get them to, I, I, I tried to talk to them to see that just because I was a professional baseball player didn't make me a professional basketball player. But at that time, and even now the rules are different, if you play anything professionally, you um, can't play in high school. And I was kind of upset, the coach was upset, my teammates were upset that I couldn't play basketball in high school. As a matter of fact, I went back to my 50th high school reunion, and that's the first thing <laughs> that one of the gals that I played against in junior high school came up and said, I'm still mad you couldn't play basketball in high school this 50 years. I'm saying, get over it, Judy. <laughs> but she said, ah, I was so mad. And I said, so was I. So that conflict plus when I went to college we didn't have college sports but I I couldn't have played anyway I couldn't have played in college either anything and um